Chokma and hello, my name is Jenny Davis and I'll be providing brief discussant comments on the unsettling multilingualism insights from non-polyglossic communities around the globe panel. I would like to thank the panel organizers for the invitation to read and be in conversation with these great papers and presentations. I'm excited to see this topic given such robust attention and to see the historical, political and social context around four continents discussed. I am joining the discussion today from what is now called Illinois and the United States, which is the traditional territories of the Peoria, Kaskaskia, Piankasha, Wea, Miami, Mascouten, Ottawa, Sauk, Meskwaki, Kickapoo, Potawatomi, Ojibwe, and Chickasaw nations. And a quick note about terminology before I get started. Throughout my comments, I use the term indigenous as an analytic, not only for lived realities, but also to refer to the relationships between groups and our traditional territories and between uh, those same groups and longstanding and still ongoing imperial regimes. As you will have seen in watching these presentations, the talks on this panel have provided enough information and theorizing for hours, hopefully years of discussion. Today, however, I have only 10 minutes. As such, I will try to keep my comments to some of the larger themes and interventions I see across the panel as a whole. And hopefully we'll be able to get into some of the details in the question and answer section. First, the talks today model really exceptionally the importance of considering the full sociolinguistic and material context in which multilingualism includes not only indigenous languages, but also Creoles and dominant language varieties, while also recognizing the coexistence of spoken and sign languages um, that can and do coexist. In this way, in examining the often overlooked dynamics and context of specific multilingual settings, these papers also point us uh, to ways um, that we can think about linguistic contexts that are in fact true all over the globe. In doing so, these presentations and the extensive research they represent provide an important and timely invitation to reconsider not only what gets counted as a language and how those are defined, as Miami linguist Wesley Leonard has invited us to do, but also what continues to be framed as the unmarked or normal and what is surprising, remarkable, or unusual. It is these framings of unusualness in which those most closely aligned with colonial regimes and particularly with whiteness are rewarded for exceptionalism. In other words, speaking multiple so-called global languages, while those least aligned with empire, especially black and or indigenous peoples, and please note that I do not pos uh, position those as inherently separate categories, are positioned as deficient, uncivilized, or otherwise culturally or cognitively deficient for the same practices. The authors definitely show how non-polyglossic multilingualism requires a different understanding of language than recent theorizations of linguistic super diversity, which in positing multilingualism as a new phenomenon emerging out of globalization, inadvertently, we hope, uh, present multilingualism as the exception and monolingualism or bilingualism as default, especially in historical context. In doing so, the scholars today interrupt not only the newness of this phenomenon and the assumption that these conversations are best understood through an analysis of the global north, but they also refuse the neoliberal, colonial, and capitalist assumptions of why multilingualism exists. In other words, rather than in service of maximizing access to global markets or capital, non-polyglossic non multilingualism operates within a nexus that centers interpersonal and intergenerational relationships. These scholars also demonstrate the productive space between expectation, between how things have been presented in academic literatures or are represented in language ideologies and how they play out in interaction. This space shows us that the frequently taken for granted connection between language and identity, particularly at the ethnic or social categorical level should be treated as neither commonsensical nor a global universal. And these spaces between expectation and what is observed uh, align closely with what Comanche linguist and anthropologist Barbara Meek calls sociolinguistic disjunctures that show us the contextual factors of when, how, and why multilingualism occurs, be they differences between age and interpersonal closeness, 
the relationship between matrilineal and patrilineal linguistic inheritance or exogamous marriage practices that are key to fully understanding any linguistic practice, multilingual or otherwise. And finally, in the introduction, Vaughn and Singer note that the small scale multilingualism discussed throughout papers today exists often in the peripheries of empire. And several of the presentations demonstrated the role of colonialism and empire in shaping those multilingual practices from impacting movement of indigenous peoples to the introduction and enforcement of colonial languages. This seems a critical point and one which invites us to take seriously the organizers invitation to unsettle existing frameworks of multilingualism and language more broadly. Here I'm struck by the work of several people to demonstrate where multilingualism can be found in the historical archive. Empire historian Antoinette Burton's work, particularly her book, The Trouble with Empire, invites us to ask not just where might we locate these practices and communities in the historical archive, although this is deeply exciting work, but also what role those, these very practices of non-hierarchical linguistic multiplicity in fact, shaped the linguistic ideologies and practice of empire itself and its metropoles. For as she notes, the very character of imperial power was shaped by its challengers and by the trouble they made for its stewards. Empire arguably, arguably has no history outside of these struggles. And I would argue that um, uh, in, empirical linguistic studies have no history outside of those struggles either. In other words, perhaps one of the means of disrupting the narratives of indigenous linguistic and cultural deficiency is to show how much the existence and persistence of small scale multilingualisms have shaped colonial attempts to render the world monolingual and polyglossic. In doing so, we should also be mindful that this work must draw on and speak back to multiple fields of study whose, broad, whose borders are murky already not just those classified as linguistics or sociolinguistics and their close kin like linguistic anthropology, but also areas like history, indigenous and aboriginal studies, and so on. As Ruth Singer notes in her presentation, small scale multilingualism is a regional system that extends beyond language itself, and these papers have shown that the questions raised in the study of non-polyglossic multilingualism requires a robust enthusiasm for multiple modes and fields of research. These papers have shown the value of studies of historical and linguistic records, surveys and interviews, ethnography, discourse analysis, and more, often collected and analyzed through collaborations across teams of scholars and community theorists, and of course, the multilingual speakers themselves. In fact, scholars in this workshop have shown through careful attention to the geographic, historical, political, and linguistic specificity, just how rich and diverse these dynamics are. That is in itself a refusal or turning upside down of the colonial urge to make things easily and neatly categoric, categorize, neatly put into categories, let's say that. Um, as we continue this conversation, I am struck by how many things we might have to unsettle in our fields. How do we represent linguistic phenomena? What do maps of multilingualism look like? When our norms for visualizing language on territory assume discrete, neat boundaries between languages and between languages and territories. What does it look like when there are four to seven languages spoken in a given area and the differences between being a speaker or not may not be shared across, may not even be shared across an entire household. As a quick example, um, from the context of my own research and native community, here are two maps. Uh, this first one is a typical map demonstrating the geographic distribution of indigenous language families in what is now the United States prior to European arrival. The second is a much more recent rendering of tribal territories. The contrast between these two, in which the first suggests no overlap in communities or languages, while the second shows extensive overlap, a context in which we should expect various forms of multilingual practices. These two images demonstrate how pervasively indigenous peoples and humanity in general has been framed as monolingual as a default and how much we have to gain by centering indigenous and non-polyglossic multilingualisms in our models of language and social life. And I deeply look forward to this conversation um, as we move forward. Chok and thank you to the organizers again. <laughs>